his name's Dr. Zishan Ade, and he'll be covering polycystic ovary syndrome, or better known as PCOS, uh, and the role of nutrition uh, on this. So Dr. Zishan Adain worked in the Accident and Emergency Department of Box Hill Hospital before making the switch to general practice. He has also completed a Master's in Public Health and Tropical Medicine at James Cook University and has been practicing for 10 years. Z currently also works as the club doctor for the Melbourne Demons in the AFL and has a fierce passion for the role of diet and nutrition in weight loss as well as the prevention and management of diseases such as diabetes, cholesterol disorders, high blood pressure and heart disease. Z's journey is also one of a personal transformation where he went from 110 kilograms in April 2010 to a lean, mean fighting machine, 82 kilograms by August 2011. He has a keen interest in the ketogenic element of the paleo and primal lifestyles. Welcome, Dr. Z, thank you. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, this talk's gonna be about polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's kind of gonna be about this and it's kind of not gonna be about this. So I'm gonna go off at a few tangents and have a discussion about a few things. So you got a little bit of a story about myself. Um, I'm not an endocrinologist, I'm not a gynecologist. I don't have PCOS, I don't even have ovaries. So um, people may say, what right do you have to talk about this? But I do have a brain and I am a doctor and I've seen fair few people come through the clinic with, with this sort of ailment and struggle with it. So I thought um, we'd talk about it today because it does generate a little bit of uh, interest uh, in the community. So I just thought I'd throw this slide in to start with, um, just as a sort of a background. So what does the word doctor even mean? It comes from the Latin word to mean, means to teach. And medicine's um, derived from Latin as well, and it means the art of healing. So a rough definition would be the ma to maintain and restore health by prevention and treatment of illness in human beings. So I just want you to remember this as we go through the talk today, particularly the last point. Um, not just treatment, but prevention. Um, and this is an interesting little slide I found here for a bit of fun, where things sometimes go around in, in full circle. If you, if you have a look through uh, some of the progressions of the thought process in medicine. Uh, and the other thing about modern medicine, I think, um, without sort of ripping into it too much, is that there's a certain element of tunnel vision. So you sort of get focused on, on uh, one, one aspect of the body or one aspect of, of clinical medicine and you sort of put all your resources into that when you're trying to um, manage illnesses. So that's meant to be a tunnel on the right. So couldn't find many pictures. And on the left, obviously, we've got uh, nails and hammer. So an analogy another doctor once said to me was, when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail. So think about that as well as we go through this um, talk today. So I wanted to throw in a, a concept or a, a term, homeostasis, which is basically the tendency of an organism or a cell to regulate its internal condition. So there's a system of feedback whether that's negative or positive. Um, and the whole idea is to stabilize health and functioning regardless of the outside changing conditions. And basically, if you think of the body as a whole, you know, there's a lot of factors that uh, interplay to keep us in homeostasis. And when something goes awry, like an environmental influence, um, this can be knocked out of whack. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well as we go forward. Um, everyone's heard about hormones. Um, what are they? put it simply, they're chemical messengers by the body. They can mainly travel through your bloodstream to tissue or distant tissue or organs, although it can be to um, nearby organs as well. They work slowly over time and they affect different processes. Um, some of them include growth and development, metabolism, sexual function, reproduction, mood, etc., etc. And you can see there's different systems here um, that um, You've got your thyroid gland, your adrenals, ovaries, testes, pancreas, etc., etc. Now, it's important not to just think of one sort of um, hormonal axis by itself because there's an interplay between all of them in the body to keep us in, in homeostasis. So, anyway, I think that's a bit of background done. So, basic anatomy, I think most of us would know 
what the uh, female reproductive tract looks like. But here's a cross section. So you've got your ovaries, the fallopian tubes. In the middle, you've got the uterus, um, cervix, vagina, and um, yeah. So here's another picture. It's a little bit more gross, but that's what it really looks like. Um, so that's a view in a, a laparoscopy, which is keyhole surgery, and you can see some of the structures in there um, that we just mentioned in the last slide. So the menstrual cycle, most of you would be aware of the menstrual cycle. So there's a few different phases, the follicular phase, the ovulation, luteal phase, menstruation. So essentially, you've got uh, gonadotrophin releasing hormone released from the <coughs> hypothalamus to the pituitary, which releases FSH, which causes the follicles in the ovaries to mature. Then you've got ovarian uh, follicle, and then you've got an interplay of estrogen, which slows down the FSH and starts LSH. Then the LH surges and you get a you get ovulation and from there you get progesterone released in increased quantities which slows the LH and then prepares the uterus for uh, implantation after conception um, and then you've got menstruation that happens afterwards and the cycle cycle continues. It's a graphical representation of what happens both both looking at the um, the follicle the temperature different levels of those certain hormones, LH and FSH, estradiol, progesterone, and just sort of the endometrial cycle, looking at the, um, the thickness of the wall as well. So uh, I'm sure most of you have probably seen that in some, some form. Um, so shifting over to polycystic ovarian syndrome, so a bit of the epidemiology. So it's an important cause of both menstrual irregular, uh, irregularity and androgen excess in women. So it's been estimated that 12% to 21% of Australian reproductive age women will suffer some form of PCOS. So that's almost one in five people, um, which is really quite high if you think about it. And the, the, the sort of the other worrying thing is that of the people with PCOS in Australia, 70% of them will remain undiagnosed. So that's a, that's a lot of people out there that will have some sort of manifestation of PCOS, not knowing that they have it. Um, and of course, there's variations across ethnic groups as well uh, in the presentation of the, of the illness. So people of Asian background tend to have more of the metabolic features rather than the weight gain or, or, or the androgenic features. And in indig indigenous populations, it can be up to as high as 21%. Um, so... That's another thing to, to note if you think about the indigenous population in Australia with, with all the other ailments that they suffer and, and think about the environmental influences that could be at play there. So how does it present? How does PCOS typically present? So there's not one way that it presents. It can present in a diverse uh, number of ways. So it's not like, you've, not like an acute illness where someone breaks a bone. It's quite obvious when they break a bone, you know, what's going on. So some of the manifestations can be chronic and they can happen over a lifetime and they can wax and wane. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I've just separated them into three categories. So you can have the reproductive um, presentation, so the increase in the androgens, um, increase in hair, so hirsutism, it's uh, increased hair, and ovulation, so you're not actually ovulating because those, when we talked about the menstrual cycle, those follicles don't actually mature. Um, and infertility, it's a big problem in society now with PCOS. Then there's metabolic uh, implications as well. So insulin resistance, impaired glucose tolerance, type 2 diabetes, and increased cardiovascular risk profile. So I want you to remember these, these ones that I've spoken about because I'm going to touch on it later. And we're going we're gonna to talk about the relationship metabolic syndrome and PCOS has. And lastly, but not not least important the psychological factors of having PCOS. This is often uh, neglected by um, a lot of people when, they, when they're looking at uh, presentations and management because it can cause a whole lot of anxiety and depression and, and reduce quality of life for a whole, whole number of reasons which I will touch on a bit later. Um, interestingly in adolescents they tend to have more of the hyperandrogenic features. Uh, in 20s and 30s it becomes more of a fertility issue and afterwards the metabolic features um, uh, can show themselves up more prominently. Um, if you're overweight it can be more earlier, more early. 
Uh, and weight gain and psychological features are attributable to all ages. This slide here is a bit of a good sum it's a good summary of what happens or a, li a little bit of a schema of what happens in PCOS. So there's there's genetic and there's environmental influences and, and yes there's a genetic predisposition to some of these things but I will be talking a bit more about the environmental influences later. So roughly 60 to 70 people 70% uh, of people with PCOS um, have symptoms of hyperandrogenism and insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia can affect anywhere between 50 to 80 percent. And the real question often poses is, does a PCOS cause the insulin resistance or does the insulin resistance cause the PCOS? Um, and we will talk about that down the track. So in this picture you can see that genetics and lifestyle um, causes hormonal changes and in this, in this graph here They've got in, increased insulin um, over here as a, as a as a as a consequence of obesity and hormonal changes. Whereas I would almost think that the insulin, the high insulin, would go over the top and cause the hormonal changes. I'll explain that in a little bit more detail as we get through the talk. But you can see that there's an interplay between the androgens and the increased insulin, and and you get all these sort of symptoms down there. Um, and how they sort of feed into all these issues. A couple of tricky slides. So I'll start with the one on the right. So insulin resistance, well they say here in this slide that obesity causes insulin resistance. I, I think it's the other way around. And, but anyway, the insulin resistance also affects the hyperandrogenism and the LH excess as well can cause that as well from a primary cause centrally. Um, and that all sort of puts puts uh, things towards the, the um, towards polycystic ovarian syndrome. And if you look at the the picture on the left, it's sort of what ha some of the biochemical pathways that that happen in the um, in the uh, ovaries. And if you look at the bottom right hand corner, you've got you've got insulin down there, and that sort of feeds back. So the whole concept of homeostasis comes into play here. So those negative and positive um, things you see there, the signs, that sort of a negative feedback and positive feedback and when when you've got something out of whack like either too much insulin in your body it actually promotes the production of androgens in the in, in the um, in the ovaries and that sort of promotes the whole issue of uh, PCOS so hopefully that makes a bit of sense to you so how do we diagnose it so there's a few different co categories for diagnosis, but I think the Rotterdam category is probably the best. Um, so you've got oligo or anovulation, so in not not much ovulation or no ovulation at all, and you've got some of the clinical or biochemical signs of hyperogen hyper I can never say that word hyperandrogenism, such as the extra hair or the male pattern baldness or um, the central weight gain as well. Uh, and then polycystic ovaries on um, on ultrasound. So those follicles, rather than maturing, and you're only having a few of them, you've got lots of little follicles that haven't matured. So that's polycystic ovaries. It's also important to exclude other other causes such as thyroid problems, uh, increased production of prolactin, and congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and some other tumors and Cushing syndrome. The point is, though. It's not one of those diseases or conditions or syndromes that you either have it or you don't have it. I really believe that it all falls on a spectrum. So for the purpose of statistical analysis and for the purposes of funding for certain treatments, yes, it's important to have clear diagnostic criteria, but just say you've only got one of the three criteria, so you're not actually technically diagnosed with PCOS, does that mean you can go off and relax and say, I don't have it? Or do you think really I'm on that I'm on the cusp of being diagnosed, or I'm sh I'm shifting further towards the spectrum, down the spectrum towards having uh, PCOS and all those complications? I think I think that's probably more important to looking at it as a spectrum, um, looking at things on a spectrum on a, on a continuum. So you want to push yourself back the other way, so away from um, PCOS or complicated PCOS. So some of the psychological features that we touched on before, but I'll go through again. So there's, a, there's definitely people with PCOS associated with increased anxiety, depression, psychosexual dysfunction, and low self-esteem. 
no self-esteem. And a lot of this comes from that core core issue of um, challenging what the female identity is because of changing body image, obesity, excess hair, male pattern baldness, infertility, acne, um, all these issues um, can cause problems with your self-esteem and with your with your mental state. And this, I think, this sums it up quite well for people with PCO. So the quality of life is affected from all sorts of different angles. So eating disorders, um, obviously, people you know people with PCOS generally a lot of them are overweight and they're desperate to get that weight down, um, and they see it as a failure on themselves. So it, it, it opens up the doors to all sorts of eating disorders. There's anxiety. There's poor body image. And all of this interplay makes things a lot worse with um, with trying to um, treat the illness. So some of the reproductive features. So these are the ones that are probably best recognised, and they they form the basis of the criteria as well. So some of the features are the hyperandrogenism, the anovulation, subfertility, the the polycystic ovaries on an ultrasound. Um, fertility is not always impaired with PCOS. Um, and age and BMI have a critical role in in fertility risk. So the higher the age and higher the BMI, the more likely PCOS sufferers will be having issues with uh, fertility. Um, and then the metabolic implications as well. So weight gain, you know, there's a five to ten percent fold um, pr uh, risk of progression from pre-diabetes to type two diabetes, up to seventh uh, fold increase of type two diabetes. Uh, increased prevalence of metabolic syndrome, increase in cardiovascular risk factors as well. Um, I just put this slide up there because typically the, the weight distribution tends to be on, as a figure on the left, more abdominal, more central rather than a typical pear shape. The slide didn't come out very well, but this summarizes basically, I'm not going to go through all of it, but basically this is the target treatment in PCOS. So when you break it down to the amenorrhea, so not having your periods or the not, the anovulation. So lifestyle changes, and that's going to be the crux of my talk from here on, talking about the lifestyle changes. Five to ten percent loss of body weight um, for people with PCO has, sh has shown incredible improvements in their symptoms and their disease state. Um, people can go on the pill and you can have cyclic or progesterone, metformin, which stops the production of glucose or release of glucose from the liver. There's a whole lot of ways that you can tackle the issue of the excess hair, from cosmetic therapy to laser to pharmacological therapy such as spironolactone, which is a uh, anti-androgen anti uh, medication. But even all of those things, I mean, obviously there's a place and a role for them because it helps with those psychological factors and it helps uh, women um, so sort of go around and not not feel like they're being ostracized for whatever particular reasons, but it doesn't fix the under uh, the fundamental driver to what's pushing someone into the syndrome state. Um, infertility as well. Um, certain medications like clomiphene and 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 other and other issue and other things like IVF and all that can sort of overcome the infertility issue. Um, and then there's a cardiovascular risk profiling as well. So. That's some of the targeted management. As you can see, it's quite a complicated, um, complicated regime there. But for the purpose of today's talk, I'm going to look mainly at the, the lifestyle change that we can do and why some of those things can work and why that can uh, fix the fundamental driver in PCOS. So before people look at this slide and think I'm nuts, that's something I pulled out of a very um, an excellent peer-reviewed journal article that went through some of the features of PCOS, went through the pathogenesis, went through the diagnosis, and then they went to talk about lifestyle management. And they made this point that 5 to 10% of weight reduction can significantly reduce insulin resistance and get rid of a lot of the features of PCOS. However, the conventional weight loss strategies have been a low fat, low GI, low calorie diet and you can see that the recommendations some of these more than 50 percent of your your breads and your cereals and your rice and your pastas and your noodles um, vegetables I don't have a problem with fruit milk yogurt and then you, you see right at the top there's lean meat fish poultry eggs nuts and legumes so what's going on here um, you know they, they talk about low GI look we, we eat the low GI bread and, the, and you know the low GI cereals but we're not dealing with the average population. People with PCOS 
through, as you can see with the metabolic implications, they're already, already metabolically broken. So the whole concept of the GI, you know, glycemic index, it goes out the window because that's an average for, for someone who's normal in the population, not someone who's struggling uh, with the metabolic parameters as it is. So they talk about glucose being released slowly in the system um, for food that has low GI. I mean, that's great. You release the, uh, the glucose slowly so you have this continuous influx of insulin. Um, and when all bets are off for people that are metabolically damaged. So sometimes low GI foods are even worse because the area under the curve is just even more. But So lifestyle management, yeah, there's a problem there. And most people with PCOS are very diligent. They want to get better. They want to have that chance of having that child. They're highly motivated, a lot of them. So they'll, they'll listen to all the advice. They'll go off and do this. They'll, they'll religiously cut their calories down, exercise excessively, eat ma mainly bread, cereals, rice, crackers, and all these things, and not lose the weight, and then get told that they're not doing anything properly. So metabolic syndrome, what is it? I've touched on it before. So if you look there on the left, it's space. These are diagnostic criteria, but metabolic sy syndrome is basically, or syndrome X as it was in the past, is a cluster of characteristics that people can have that if we identify them, shows up, shows up early and we can sort of look at them and say, they're gonna be at higher risk for all these illnesses, all these chronic illnesses, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, heart disease, some cancers, dementia, etc., etc. And I think PCOS should not be thought as an association with metabolic syndrome. I think PCOS should fit under the umbrella of metabolic syndrome. So someone with metabolic syndrome is expressing themselves, or women expressing themselves having PCOS. Um, some of the diagnostic criteria are three of the, the following um, five. So one is waist circumference, um, an increased waist circumference, which I'll talk about in a sec. Then raised triglycerides over 1.7, reduce HDL in women less than 1.29, blood pressure over 130 over 85 and a fasting sugar level over 5.6 or being treated for any of those conditions. Now the very important thing I think is to look at the ethnic differences. Classically uh, uh, the Caucasian or European it's about 100 centimeters for men and um, uh, sorry yeah 100 centimeters for men and 88 or 90 centimeters for women but if you look down the list um, at uh, Asian populations, it, it's a lot more restricted. You know, w women should have a waist centimeter, a waist circumference less than 80 centimeters in a lot of Asian populations. So, basically, you got to look at the ethnic group, and you got to look at the, the susceptibility um, through that. So, I've used this slide before in previous talks, but the classic way of thinking has been for a while has been. People have a, a, an issue with their caloric intake, they become obese, and that obesity in itself predisposes them to increased risk for things like insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver, high blood pressure, etc., etc., all of those sort of things. So I think we've got to take a step back and not have that tunnel vision and think, what's driving the obesity? Is it the same thing that's driving all these other things? So classically, weight control is all about being about uh, scales. You know, the calories in versus calories out. So if you take in um, take in more calories and you expend, you're in a positive caloric balance, and you're going to put on weight. That's that's what we were all taught when we were growing up. It sounds great in theory, and I'm not disputing the law of thermodynamics, the first law of thermodynamics. But I'm saying it's not important. I mean, what is a calorie? Calorie is 4.2 joules, or one kilocalorie is 4.2 kilocalories. It, it, all it is is a quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius under standard conditions. That's all it is. How you apply that to the human body, it's, it's, you know, it totally loses its, its meaning. I mean, we're so fixated on this law of thermodynamics that um, we're fixated on reducing our caloric intake because people were smart enough to put certain foods into incinerators and work out their caloric quantity. They realize that fat has, fat one gram of fat has uh, nine kilocalories versus protein and carbs, which is four. So the whole idea was to reduce your intake, have less fat because it's got more, more calories in it. But obviously it's more energy dense. Wouldn't that be a fuel that's more appropriate to have? Um, I'm, I'm sure this crowd is well aware of all the whole issue with calories. 
And then when the whole calories thing doesn't work, the whole calories in, calories out thing doesn't work, we either blame the uh, individual or we come up with fantastic ways of losing weight, you know, innovation, so to speak. And there's a whole industry built on this. And, and I'm sure a lot of the, you know a lot about these, but let's go through some of them. Liposuction, you're taking out fats. You're not fixing the metabolic driver that's causing the fat cells to swell. Bariatric surgery, yeah, look, sometimes that may be the last dish option, but it's on the rise. Feeding tubes, you know, this, you know, let's get people not eating food, we'll just stick feeding tubes in them. Caffeine induced tights, you know, that'll raise your metabolic rate. And th these are real things. The vibra fork with sens sensor motor technology. Basically, if you're shoveling food too quickly into your mouth, the fork will start vibrating and it'll stop you from eating quickly. Um, you know, it's ridiculous. Plastic tongue mesh. Putting an actual postage size, postage stamp size mesh on your tongue, so the actual process of eating becomes painful. So it, it encourages to eat less. This is real surgery being done. Tongue lamination. You put a layer on your tongue so you can't actually, your taste buds don't feel the food, so you have no desire to eat. Um, this is a good one. Cool sculpting or, or cryolipolysis. Um, you know, apparently fat cells freeze at a higher temperature than the rest of your cells. So let's um, let's freeze them. So this is a this is a treatment that just got FDA approval in America about two years ago, and it's being used in certain places in in, in Melbourne. Um, so the idea is you you freeze your fat cells. Um, yeah, they kill off 20% of your fat cells. Yes, we still got 80% of your fat cells still there. So they'll just take up the extra adipose. Uh, they'll just take it. They'll just get bigger then in proportion. And the, the brilliant thing about this, the way it's marketed is, is it won't work straight away. Give it four to six months, then you'll see the results. Now someone who's crazy enough to go and get something like this, or sorry, not crazy, desperate enough to get something like this, is gonna be trying all sorts of things. They're gonna lose, they're probably gonna lose a bit of weight in four to six months anyway, but they'll then associate it back to the, uh, the cool sculpting. So, and that's, a, that's an ad there for the, for the cool sculpting, you know? Freeze your fat, I, I don't know, if you're going to end up looking like that, because they're certainly not going to put fake boobs in for free either. <laughs> anyway, so there's low calorie shakes and juice fasts and, and fat shaming, shaming the individual who's overweight. That's, that's a tactic. You know, you use special shoes as well. You know, walk on these shoes and you'll lose weight. And then you've got drugs like duramine, which hasn't been quality tested since the 70s. Uh, and basically, that's like a speed that you can get legally to lose weight. Um, so anyway, we could go on and on about this, but you know, you, what's caused all this? What's caused us to get into this process where we're we're failing at, you know, balancing our calories? So we look for these other measures, you know, these innovations to help us lose weight. And look, many people may have tried all sorts of things such as this, and that's this, that's fine. But you know, it's because the, the method we've been told to lose weight has been wrong. The whole calorie issue. So. An alternate theory to weight regulation, and I'll still call it a theory because, um, you know, it's not really been accepted. But I think it's not about the calories; it's about the macronutrient quantities and, and quality that you have, and how it influences your body, both in a hormonal level and a biochemical level. So some of the important players in this are insulin and fructose and leptin, and inflammation. So the imbalance between omega three and omega six, and then. You can't discount the psychological factors involved in, in weight gain as well. The whole issue of food reward and, you know, eating out of boredom or habit and then, you know, the whole dependence or addiction side of things, which I probably won't go into in much detail. But I'll talk a lot about insulin now because we've heard about PCOS and its role with insulin resistance. So I've used this slide before and I've actually most people would know that in the average person when we eat, what happens to the sugar level, the carbohydrate goes up the most, carbohydrate pushes it up the most and you've got protein and fat. And someone who's got PCOS or metabolic dysregulation, this increase will be even more and, and it'll be even more dramatic when you look at insulin curves. So why does a person with insulin resistance produce so much insulin? Unlike muscle and adipose tissue, for glucose to get into the cell, it doesn't need insulin to open those gates in the pancreas. So in the pancreas, through the GLUT2 receptor, glucose goes freely into the pancreas and starts a cascade of events that releases insulin. So if, if your muscles, which make up the bulk of a lot of your mass, aren't very good at receiving the glucose because the insulin's not opening those doors, 
and the pancreas can take the glucose freely, it'll go into the pancreas, cause more insulin production, which will help unlock those doors. And, and just digressing for a moment, why do diabetics have issues with um, uh, you know, dementia, uh, nerve problems, cardiovascular disease, um, kidneys, eyes, all of these sort of things. Because all those, all those cells and those organs work through different transport mechanisms of glucose. They don't need insulin to let glucose into the cell. So you get this higher influx of glucose into those cells and that causes damage. So it's the endothelial cells, all the cells in the blood vessel wall, um, they can take up the glucose easily without insulin. So you've got an influx of glucose in there that causes this damage. So insulin basically opens the gate, lets the glucose go through. Excess glucose, what happens to it? It's stored in the liver it's stored, or stored in the muscle. So the more active you are, the more fuel that muscle requires. So it uses up stored glucose. So going for a walk or going for a run will help you lose weight in a way, but it's not by burning calories. It's by making your muscles more efficient or more likely to take up that glucose out of your bloodstream. Um, what happens to excess glucose that's not stored? So when we get hung, when people get hungry often, and they're and they're they're running basically on glucose as their primary fuel rather than fat, they'll basically take in a lot of glucose in the diet, and often will overshoot. So we use whatever we need for energy, then some is stored in uh, muscle, some is stored in liver, and whatever else isn't stored, it can't stay in the bloodstream, it has to be put somewhere. So the body puts it into the fat cell. So this is a bit of a messy slide, but essentially the crux of this is high insulin will promote the, produ um, the influx of glucose into the fat cell, and it blocks the mechanisms that help break down the stored fat, the triglyceride. So the whole point is if one fat cell can represent all the fat in your body, Having a constantly high insulin level uh, will mean that you're not going to be breaking down that fat when, you, when you're needing fuel for your body. Uh, energy, again, I've used this in previous slides. So, what, is it, what, what do you need energy for? For bodily functions, physical activity, growth and repair, and that's a breakdown of what the energy expenditure in the body is. Um, and ATP is basically the currency which, which with the energy currency and you have this whole cascade, this whole pathway that, that occurs and in a cellular level, I'm not going to go into the details of the whole Krebs cycle and all this, but glucose plays an important role in, in, in providing energy production, but equally fatty acid and ketone bodies can, can do the same. So, you know, a lot of you are probably familiar with this, but basically people will be like, well, if you're not having a lot of glucose in your bloodstream, what else can you use as fuel? And you can use ketone bodies, you can use fatty acids. Um, and we don't want, really want to use protein breakdown because that'll take your muscle away. That's a picture of the Krebs cycle showing an alternate pathway with the uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate. So most of you are probably aware of uh, insulin and how insulin resistance can, can, can call, cause a problem, but leptin, uh, a lot less is known about leptin. I think it was discovered in 94 and we thought that finding out about leptin is going to solve all our obesity problems because they found that Leptin is basically a hormone that gets released from our fat cells that tells our brain we're, uh, we're full, we don't need to eat anymore. So it's a regulator of appetite. Um, and people thought that if you took um, serum levels of, of leptin in obese people, that they would have um, really low leptin levels. And maybe giving them leptin would actually fix the problem. But the funny thing was when they measured uh, leptin levels in obese people, they actually found the opposite to be true. They found leptin levels to be really high in the, in the bloodstream and the whole concept of leptin resistance uh, came up. So you can see what happens there in that picture. Um, leptin level falls with weight loss and it rises with, uh, with weight gain. But there's an interplay between insulin and leptin and also fructose that promotes this leptin resistance. So basically in a nutshell, your leptin your leptin's not doing its job, it's not getting received. So it's trying to tell the brain, hang on, we're full, we don't need to eat anymore, but the brain's not getting that message. And so you've got this whole issue with overeating. Fructose, we all know about fructose. Um, naturally found in fruits and some vegetables. Um, half of sugar with glucose. And we're having it in, in massive quantities now in, in this day and age, and that's really exponentially rise in the last 30 years. So you can get it through sugar, high fructose corn syrup in the States, uh, honey and fruits. And basically, fructose is one of those things that affects 
uh, many systems in the body through its through its action. I mean, only the liver can use it, so it burdens the liver. Uh, you get fatty liver, you get triglycerides that go up, you get inflammation, and it can have a flow-on effect to all these uh, organs and, and cause so much problems. Um, and then the metabolic syndrome, the issues of metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes. So I think if you relate it back to PCOS, the great influx in fructose, and if you remember back to that original graph where we had um, environmental influences and lifestyle influences, the fructose really is one of those environmental influences that's really driving this process that causes insulin resistance and, and, and leading to PCOS under the umbrella of metabolic resistance. Even wheat and grains, you know, they can cause issues with the gut, the gut integrity, and you can get certain um, certain things, uh, certain particles in the in the bloodstream that shouldn't be there, and the immune system can sort of go into overdrive, recognizing these as as foreign uh, objects, and you can get a whole issue with autoimmunity, which we're seeing in the rise as well, and that in conjunction with PCOS can cause problems. The imbalance between omega six and omega three, so. Seed oils and, and certain grains that are high in omega-6 start this whole cascade where you get um, ar um, arachidonic acid, which leads to this whole pathway of all these pro-inflammatory um, uh, hormones and cytokines that can cause problems with weight gain as well. Even fat tissue is, a, is an endocrine organ. We just thought it was a storage unit. But it, as I said, it releases leptin and all sorts of other um, hormones and cytokines and factors which pr produce inflammation which cause uh, issues with the weight gain and those aspects. So American diet or Western diet, it's, I think this really summarizes it really well. The sugar, the vegetable oils and the refined grains all in their unique ways cause damage to the liver. And the, we, we really underestimate the, the role of the liver in, in maintaining homeostasis of, of, in, of, of uh, sugar and insulin. I mean people think my insulin comes out of the pancreas, so it's really the pancreas job to look after insulin. But the way the, gluco uh, the way glucose is produced and uh, stored and then released by the liver, and, and it's really the liver that plays a very important role in keeping us in a, in a normal insulin state, not becoming hyperinsulinemic. I mean, it's very rare to find someone with a, a pristine liver that's got insulin resistance. Um, and simple graph, you know, if your insulin levels are relatively low, you're going to have more fat breakdown. Um, and it's not just about weight, those lifestyle factors with PCOS, you're actually reversing the whole process of insulin resistance and by such reducing, reversing the whole syndrome of, of PCOS as well. Now people often say, but I know so and so that eats, you know, X, Y and Z amounts of carbs or grains or etc. throughout the day. And I think this graph really beautifully summarizes some of the those issues so essentially on the on the on the x-axis the, the the horizontal axis you've got grams of carbohydrates consumed per day and on the vertical axis you've got BMI now I know everyone says the BMI is not a great tool and yeah look it probably isn't at, at some individual level but for this level we'll look at the BMI between 20 and 25 as being normal um, I'm tipping most people with PCOS, well a lot of people with PCOS have an elevated BMI and it's not because they're bodybuilders, it's because they're, they're overweight. So you look at, you look at these, um, these lines and it shows how much carbohydrate restriction is required for different people to get back into that normal BMI. And I would suggest people that are displaying features of PCOS or insulin resistance are quite carbohydrate intolerant. There's people on the bottom, you'll see the extremely carbohydrate tolerant that can just keep upping their carbohydrate intake and it doesn't matter to them. They stay in their normal BMI. There's some people with mild insulin resistance and moderate. And then you have this group here on the left, in the, the red line. Any sort of, any increase in carbohydrate intake really shoots up their BMI because of their intolerance and their predisposition to getting uh, insulin resistance. So look, in a way, um, you really have to target target the individual based on these sort of lines, and people can shift between them. You know, you can go from being moderately insulin resistant to all of a sudden being severely insulin resistant for a number of factors. So, what am I getting to with all of this? What am I alluding to? I'm alluding to a, carbo a low carbohydrate, high fat diet. Now, I don't like labels, but I've put one here anyway. I mean, is it really a low carbohydrate diet, or is it what we're eating in society these days is a high carbohydrate diet. But 
the basis of this is eating real food. You know, your fish, your meat, your you know, your avocados, lots of vegetables. Basically, you're taking away those things that re put your insulin up really quickly. Um, so all your starchy, starchy food, your grains. I mean, that's how plants store energy. We store energy as fat. Plants store energy as, as starch, and that you get that in the grains. So it causes a, a big release of insulin. Um, and people with PCOS, um, they're going to have more of a sensitivity to, to grains and to sugars, and that's going to push their insulin resistance uh, into overdrive. So oh, this is just one example of what people can eat. People with PCOS are already behind. It's 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 like um, it's like the analogy of, of football. It's the last quarter. You know, it's it's, it's three quarter time, and and you you, you know you you have six or seven goals behind. So you've got to really play excellently to get back on a level, level playing field. For someone that's, you know, if, if the score's the same, you don't have to actually play as well. You don't have to play catch-up. So someone with PCOS or insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome, they have to play catch-up. So I think it, it's very important, at least at first, to go quite hard with their dietary restrictions. And I'm not talking about calorie counting or calorie restrictions, but just basically choosing foods that keep them full and um, minimise that that insulin spike. So we, we're trying to reset the body, we're trying to heal the body. And what, what often people, happens with people, they become very impatient. So if you imagine getting to a point of a diagnosis of PCOS or insulin resistance as a slow climb up a, up, a, up, a, up, a, up a mountain and you get to a summit and then you realize, hang on, I want to make some changes and I want to change my diet, everyone else expects that there to be a cliff face on the other side. So you go straight down, but it, it'll often take a lot of time, and and particularly with a lot of with women as well, I find unlike men, they take a little bit of time to lose that weight following an approach like this. But it it, it does happen over time. So um, I'll just briefly run through some of the criticisms of of, of, of a low carbohydrate diet or a paleo template or or whatever. Um, they talk about weight loss being. Uh, water only in muscle. I've shown you that no, that low insulin unlocks the uh, unlocks the fat stores. Carbs are critical. You're actually still having carbohydrate, but they're, they're in vegetables, and you don't need as much. The whole issue with the heart disease and and uh, and all of that. Well, a low carbohydrate uh, or a paleo diet will actually improve your cardiovascular risk profile. Um, it reduces your triglycerides. It reduces your small dense um, LDL particles and increases your HDL particles or, or concentration of those particles. Uh, a very very low carbohydrate diet will promote ketosis, and it's very different from ketoacidosis. People often say yes, ketoacidosis is life threatening, but again, it's it's different from ketosis because glucose levels are kept in check, and also uh, levels of beta hydroxybutyrate are very very high. But people are like, yeah, but they're very high, but you still have a level. But if you think about glucose, if glucose goes really high, it's still it, it's a big problem, probably probably just as big as ketoacidosis. So missing micronutrients, you saw on the slide, it's all real food. You're going to get your micronutrients, long and short term. Yep, red meat and protein causes all these problems. We've all seen those studies in the last few weeks. It's, you know, it's, it's not about red meat. It's about quality quality food. We're not going high protein. Not that I think high protein causes a problem. Uh, kidney disease and socially unacceptable. I, I, I don't think that's a that's an issue now. Most places you go out, you can you can work around a menu. Um, look, if if one meal here or there when you're eating out is going to cause you more stress trying to neg negotiate that menu, then I'd rather you say just eat whatever's there for that one or one time, put it behind you, and move forward. But it's not socially unacceptable. I've linked some studies here about low carb diets versus um, a low fat or a standard American diet for weight loss that shows all of them um, have more favorable results. There's 18 of them there, you can go through them at your own time. So why are we still talking about the low carbohydrate, low calorie as the approach to, to, to fixing those, um, those issues of lifestyle? So the PCOS component of this is if we can fix the lifestyle issues, if we can fix the insulin resistance through our environment, through our diet, we don't have to worry about all those other things. We don't have to worry about the IVF and the clomiphene and all those other things. And, and certain people may still have to use that as, a, as an adjunct, but if you fix the foundation, then the rest of the house, the rest of the, the building will be okay. I mean, the analogy is, and it's an ironic analogy, 
if you're baking a cake, get the foundation right, get the, get the cake right before you worry about the icing. Um, so the take home message is nothing to do with PCOS actually from this talk, and it goes back to what I said at the start. The word doctor comes from the Latin word which means to teach, and I think to be a great teacher one needs to be able to learn, and really needs to learn these fundamental principles. Have an open mind, have the courage to throw out yesterday's ideas when they don't appear to be working anymore, and understand that scientific truth isn't final but it's constantly evolving. And I think that's what I encourage people and, uh, and other clinicians, not just with PCOS or metabolic syndrome, is to, to, to look at these things and look back and say, is the advice we're giving wrong in terms of the, the dietary advice? And that really, I think, is a very important message when it comes to a lot of the chronic diseases that we face in society at the moment. And, and I know this talk slightly oversimplifies some of these things, but I think really, if you look at these things and um, take that attitude, we can sort of we can sort of look at fixing some of the problems out there because it, people say, oh, why does it matter if someone else has PCO, got PCOS? But it, it'll affect all of us. The economy won't survive the way we're going with the reliance on healthcare for chronic illness. So prevention, not treatment, should be the foundation of what we're doing out there. Um, and that's it.